we're going to go over cellular respiration. And first of all, let's understand why we call it cellular respiration. So most of you know that respiration refers to breathing. So we can do respiration, for example, respiration in lungs, right? And when we do respiration in the lungs, we know that oxygen or O2 goes towards the lungs and therefore towards the blood eventually. And that from the lungs, we release CO2. So this is a type of respiration that takes place in the lungs. Now, in this case, we're calling it cellular respiration. And so let's first understand why we call it this. If we look here, we have the blood. And the blood now, once the lungs do what they're supposed to do, is going to have O2 in it, or oxygen inside of it. And so now if you imagine that a blood vessel is carrying that oxygen, and it's going to carry it to a body cell. And this body cell is going to need this oxygen, right? So let's go ahead and just draw a generic body cell outside of this capillary, this small blood vessel. And we know that for this cell, that the oxygen needs to diffuse from the bloodstream towards the cell to go into the cell. And that we also know that at the same time, CO2 must be released from that cell to go into the bloodstream. And so notice that this is a type of cellular respiration because it's very similar to what happened here by basically exchanging these two gases at the lungs. We are also exchanging these two gases at the cell. And so this is a cellular respiration. What we also have to include here though is the fact that there's going to be a mitochondrion within this eukaryotic cell. And that mitochondrion's purpose is to take this oxygen and also take sugar or glucose And then it will make ATP from these two, which is the energy that cells need. And in the process, it will also release this CO2 as a waste that then goes into the bloodstream. And so there is this respiration happening here but in this lecture, we're also going to talk about why we need to have glucose coming in, what the mitochondrion is doing, and how, in fact, we will end up getting ATP out of this process known as cellular respiration. A second concept that we must discuss is we need to review the idea of reduction and oxidation. And this was referred to earlier in the course when we talked about electrons moving from one atom to another atom. Now, if, let's just say, you have a molecule, let's just call it A, that has an extra electron here that it can donate. And then a molecule B that can receive that electron, 
then once this electron jumps from A to B, the result is going to be that A will not have the electron any longer and B will now have that electron. And this is happening all the time, especially in this topic of cellular respiration that we're going to talk about. Now, we say in this case that B was reduced because electrons have a negative charge on them. And so you can see how the charge was reduced. In other words, it was lessened by receiving this electron. And we say that A is oxidized. So let's understand why we use the word oxidized for losing electrons. We are talking, after all, about glucose, right? And glucose, with the help of oxygen and with the mitochondrion, we're going to end up getting ATP which is the energy molecule that cells need to do what they need to do. So, the question is, how do we make this ATP energy? And you have to remember that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Right? It changes forms. So it goes from one energy type to another energy type. And this is from your first law of thermodynamics. And so if you remember this, you have to think, well, where is the energy in the ATP molecule coming from? Well, it's coming from the electrons that are located within the glucose molecule. And what the mitochondrion is very good at doing is that it removes these electrons and gives them to other molecules within the mitochondrion. It basically steals the electrons of glucose. And by stealing these electrons, it now grabs the glucose energy and it then creates a new molecule known as ATP. And this is why we say oxidized, because notice that glucose with oxygen, right, oxidized with oxygen, we can then take these electrons and remove them and then give that energy to a new molecule known as ATP. And in fact, if you remember what the ATP molecule looks like, it's an adenosine, that's what the A stands for, triphosphate, so three phosphates. And where is the energy now, you might ask? Well, the energy in this case is going to be primarily located in this last covalent bond that you have right there between these two phosphates. So within this covalent bond, you know that you have electrons because after all, electrons are what are creating these bonds. And in fact, the ATP hydrolysis reaction which is when ATP gets hydrolyzed with water 
you remove this third phosphate and you end up getting a DP with only two phosphates left plus now you have this phosphate that is broken off but outside of this breaking of the bond right this breaking of the bond in here when the bond breaks that's where the energy comes from in order to power the cell. We are now ready to start talking about respiration and go into the details of it. So let's recall that this is known as cellular respiration because in fact, it takes place in each and every cell. So, what you want to remind yourselves again is that there is a blood vessel, if we're talking about an animal, such as ourselves, right? Of course, cellular respiration will be different depending on which organism you're talking about so if we're talking about plants, it's gonna be different. If we're talking about bacteria, it'll be different. But right now, let's just refer to animals such as ourselves that have a blood supply. And with this blood supply, we are going to get oxygen and glucose flowing to a body cell. So here's a body cell here. And this body cell has all the organelles that you've already studied. And really, the only one that we're concerned about for this lecture is the mitochondrion. And here I'm exaggerating a little bit the size of the mitochondrion. Now, what's gonna happen is, is that oxygen will diffuse into the cell and glucose will be with some transporter here, which I'm not gonna draw, will be brought into the cell. Now, not all of cellular respiration takes place inside the mitochondrion. So one thing to keep in mind is that the first step of cellular respiration is known as glycolysis. And in glycolysis, we actually stay outside of the mitochondrion. So there are proteins in the cytoplasm of the cell outside of the mitochondrion that can do glycolysis for us. Now I'm going to be going back to this picture several times, but for right now, I'm going to move it off to the side and we're going to talk about what glycolysis is. So. The first step of cellular respiration is known as glycolysis. And the reason why it's called glycolysis is because glyco means sugar and lysis means to cut. And so we're literally going to cut the glucose molecule. And so I'm gonna draw six carbons out. As a representation of glucose, because glucose, if you remember, right, is C6H12O6. So I'm just drawing out these six carbons of the glucose molecule in a linear way and your textbook oftentimes will depict it in a ring shape because that's how it actually is. But 
for this lecture, it's easier to draw it linearly because what we're going to want to do is we're, we're going to want to keep track of these carbons to see what happens to them. And so glucose is C6H12O6, right? And let's remember the overall equation of cellular respiration, which is C6H12O6 plus six oxygens, right, gives us six carbon dioxides plus six waters plus ATP and we also generate heat in the process. And so if you were to count the number of carbons on each side, they should be the same. If you were to count the number of hydrogens on each side, they should be the same. And if you were to count the number of oxygens on each side, they would be the same. And we've done this in a previous lecture of balancing this all out. So refer to that one if you forgot how to do that. But basically, the big number in front, you multiply it by the small number that refers to the atom. If there's no number referring to the atom, you assume that it's just a one. Okay? And so this is the overall reaction of cellular respiration. And what we want to say is that this is C6H12O6 glucose, which is now represented by these six carbons. And our first step is known as glycolysis, which is to cut this sugar molecule. Now, I do have a very detailed image of glycolysis, which is also found inside your textbook. And you do not have to memorize this entire image, all the steps. There are 10 steps of glycolysis. So we are going to simplify this as much as we can. And by simplifying it, we will look at the overall idea of it. So this is glycolysis in all of its detail and steps. And again, this is happening outside of the mitochondrion. And so let's keep track of the important stuff. First of all, this is the glucose molecule at the top that we start with. And it has these six carbons. And so that's important to realize. Now, every single step, we're going to get something new. And for every single step, what I have not put in here is that there is an enzyme, right? I'll just call it E1 for enzyme 1 that gives us our first product, E2 for enzyme 2 that gives us our second product, and so on and so forth. So it's a series of enzymes that gives us each and every one of these products at every single step. And you do not have to know the names of them. We're just looking at the overall idea of this. But the idea is this. Glucose with six carbons goes into the first enzyme. And notice what happens here on the left side you end up getting this ATP that has to get burnt, in a sense, in order to kickstart the whole process. ATP is the energy molecule of life, which is what we want to make overall in respiration. But notice that here you're actually burning it to, to kickstart the process.
And so ATP goes to ADP, which means you've actually used energy to, to start this process. Okay, so keep track of the ATPs here. So the ATP kicks off the process. We get this first product, glucose 6-phosphate, which you do not have to memorize. Then we go to enzyme 2. We get this fructose 6-phosphate. You do not have to memorize these names. And then once again, we get this, uh, in this case, this reversal of the uh, once again in this case we get a loss of energy where ATP gets burnt to ADP so once again we have to put energy into it in order to move this along now you get this fructose 1,6 bisphosphate and now this is a very important part of glycolysis so I'll put a star there where this one right here is still right we're still a six carbon molecule here so we haven't split it yet but notice what happens this six carbon molecule now gets cut into two three carbon molecules let's go ahead and draw out these carbons So now for the first time, we've gone from a six carbon molecule that's all connected as glucose is. We've changed it a few times, but now we've actually cut it into two, three carbon molecules. Now this, this keeps going in different steps, but let's just point out that right here, what you see is you actually get something positive in terms of energy. For the first time here, you end up getting some ATP out of this. So it's right here at this step. Now, these two are going to mirror each other and kind of do a similar thing as they move down. So over here, you get it again for the other three carbon molecule that's moving down this way. So there's your first ATP. There's your second ATP that you actually made for the first time. And then this keeps going. These three carbon molecules keep on going and changing one enzyme after another for a total of 10 steps until we finally get to the very end. And notice this very last step once again has ATP that comes out of this, right? So we get some energy out at the very end. And we have to memorize the name of the product of glycolysis. That is very important and that's known as pyruvate. So pyruvate has three carbons on it. So we get in total two pyruvates. Right? So just to summarize glycolysis we have We'll keep this close by as we look. I right, want to summarize this and what we did over here, right? And we want to say that from glycolysis, we end up getting two pyruvates. So these are both called pyruvates. And they each have th three carbons on them. And if we count up our ATPs, let's count them up because we have gotten some out of this. We've got one, two, three, and four. However, we did lose one right here and we also lost one right there. So we gained one, two, three, four. We lost two. So how many ATPs did we get out of glycolysis in total? 
a total of four minus these two. So a total of two ATPs were generated in glycolysis, right? So we have these two pyruvates, but we also got two ATPs. Well, what else can we get out of this other than two pyruvates and two ATPs? So let's remember that this whole time what we want to do is we want to oxidize glucose. We want to remove electrons from glucose. And so there's one more very important thing that happens in glycolysis, which is that at this step right here, where we go from this three carbon molecule to one three biphosphoglycerate, we end up generating what we're gonna call an electron carrier known as NADH. And we're going to do it for both of these steps. Now both of these NADHs are going to carry two electrons on them. And so this may seem like it's not a big deal, however, right? The whole purpose of this, right? The whole purpose is to take glucose and we want to oxidize it, right? And if we want to oxidize it, we want to remove electrons from the glucose molecule. So one advantage of doing all of this rearrangement, which just seems so complicated, why do we have all these 10, all these 10 steps, right? Yes, we're making ATP. Yes, we're getting this pyruvate at the end, but also something that is very important here to understand is that we have removed two electrons at this step and two electrons from at this step, which means we have begun the oxidation of glucose and removing the energy from glucose. And the result of oxidizing is that we get two of these electron carriers called NADH, which now get to carry these electrons from the glucose on them. And this is our first example of a reduction slash oxidation reaction, which sometimes we just shorten as redox. And so now we can see how we have begun stealing, in a sense, the electrons from the glucose molecule. And we're not, we don't know right now what this is all about. We're going to have to wait until the very last step of respiration. But basically, these two electrons here will be directly important to make our, our ATP at the very end of all of this. So keep this in mind as we go along. So now what we want to do is we want to finish this glycolysis off by basically saying, yes, we have these two pyruvates. Yes, we have these two ATPs, but we also have these two electron carriers called NADH. Very, very important to memorize NADH. And these two, again, are supposed to depict the electrons that are on each NADH. So now let's go back to this image to see the big picture here and to understand what happens next. So we have this glucose molecule that has six carbons, right? And again, sometimes it'll be shown as this ring, but we're doing it linearly to help us keep track of the carbons, right? And out of glycolysis, we get two pyruvates, 
So the question is now what happens, right? So there were 10 steps to bring us to these two pi root of eights. And now we can finally go into the mitochondrion. So let's go ahead and do that. These pyruvates enter the mitochondrion. And now let's draw the mitochondrion bigger to see what happens to these pyruvates. So now let's imagine that we are in this mitochondrion. Right? And we've got these two pyruvates inside the mitochondrion. So the next step is going to take one of the carbons on each of these pyruvates and remove them. And so this carbon, let's just say, gets removed and that carbon gets removed. And for the first time, we are actually taking away carbons from this, what used to be the glucose molecule. Now think about what's going to happen to these carbons before I give you the answer. If you look back at your original equation right here, the one at the very top, we see that there's carbon on the left of the arrow. C6H12O6, and there's carbon on the right of the arrow. But look at what that carbon looks like. And we said that the same numbers of carbons on the left have to equal the same on the right. And so this carbon didn't go anywhere. It just changed to another form. So if you're thinking about it this way, I hope you're thinking correctly, you are right that these carbons will eventually get released as CO2, right? Which eventually is what you breathe out of your lungs. So that's really interesting to see that this solid carbon molecule, right? Now gets turned into a gas, CO2, which you can breathe out. So that's one of the amazing things about the mitochondrion that it has the ability to, to generate this CO2 from uh, these pyruvates and then furthermore later on it's gonna, it's gonna do it again with other molecules. So we're gonna remove the CO2 and now what we have to do is we have to tether these two carbons to something. And so what's going to happen is, is that now we get a change with these two carbons now are going to get attached to a molecule called coenzyme A, which is abbreviated as just CoA. So right now you have these two carbons attach to a coenzyme A each. And we call th this molecule acetyl CoA. Acetyl CoA, because these two carbons are the acetyls and the CoA stands for coenzyme A. And of course, you have it here too acetyl CoA. So you've got two acetyl CoAs now. And again, now we're inside the mitochondrion. The mitochondrion is doing this for us. So, also what we have to say is that in this process, we also make more electron carriers. So out of this, we also get more NADH from each one of these. And remember, these are electron carriers. So there's one NADDH with those two electrons. Again, removed from the original glucose molecule, right? So we get this twice. And this whole step here 
of getting the pyruvate to then change to this acetyl-CoA is known as pyruvate oxidation, which instead of just memorizing this, try to really think about why it's called pyruvate oxidation. Well, remember that oxidation just means, right, that we take a molecule, let's just call it A, and we remove electrons from it and we give it to B. So you can imagine that A in this case is the pyruvate, and B in this case is that electron carrier NADH, right? So now that has the electrons from the pyruvate. So it's pretty interesting how all of this makes sense. We, we once again are removing electrons from this carbon molecule to generate a new molecule. And we also lose carbon dioxide or carbon in the process that generates our carbon dioxide. So let's go ahead and abbreviate this step as step two here on our original sheet. We'll call it 2-pyruvate oxidation. And pyruvate oxidation is when you take two pyruvates right from here, right? They go into this part, they go into the input here, and we end up getting two acetyl CoAs, right? However, Let's also include that we end up getting two electron carriers and we also lose carbons so that we end up getting our CO2. So we also get two electron carriers, NADH, and we also end up getting two carbon dioxides here. So now we're ready for our third step. And the third step is known as the Krebs cycle. And so basically, these two acetyl-CoAs are gonna go into what we call the Krebs cycle, which usually has this circular representation to it in textbooks. Krebs cycle, right? And this is again inside the mitochondrion. So let's go ahead and look at the details of the Krebs cycle, which is pretty fascinating. So we want to keep track that we start with acetyl-CoAs. Now what we're going to do is we're going to have just one acetyl-CoA come in. And just keep track of one because it's easier to learn it this way. Of course, two will be coming in, but let's just go ahead and understand what one of them is doing. And so within this mitochondrion, you are going to have a four carbon molecule waiting for this acetyl-CoA. And this four carbon molecule has nothing to do with the glucose carbons that we started with. Okay, it's just a four carbon molecule in and of itself, right? It's got nothing to do with any of these carbons that we started with when we talked about glycolysis and we had six right? Do not get this confused with any of those carbons. This is just another carbon molecule inside the mitochondrion. 
and is not a part of that glucose molecule that we're trying to oxidize. This is, and this is not, okay? So this acetyl-CoA, these carbons are part of that glucose molecule, but this one is not. And so in fact, I'm gonna use different colors for this. And so these will be depicted this way as the carbons from the glucose, and these instead in red will be depicted a different way. So this four carbon molecule is, no, is known as oxaloacetate. And so it's good to know the name of this one. Um, we're, we don't have to memorize all of them as we'll see, but at least know this one. It's a good one to know, right? Just to make sure that you understand that this acetyl-CoA is gonna run into it. And that's exactly what happens, right? These two basically run into each other and fuse to make a one, two, three, four, five, six carbon molecule. So those are the four carbons from oxaloacetate and these are the two carbons from acetyl-CoA. And again, don't get confused. This is now a six carbon molecule, but it is made up of carbons from oxaloacetate and also carbons from that original glucose. So don't think that it's the same as this, right? The one that you started with. Right? It's got parts of these two molecules that run into each other. Okay, so this one is known as citrate. And don't worry about memorizing that, but um, do understand that the CoA gets removed as these two fuse. The CoA gets removed, and now we can use it again for that for the next pyruvate oxidation that's gonna come in. Okay, so now we have a six carbon molecule, and now all of these have names to them, and you don't have to memorize them, but let's at least understand the big picture. So this six carbon molecule will end up getting turned into a five carbon molecule. And so notice we have lost a carbon in this process. And so think about what happened here to this carbon, right? This is one of the carbons from the original glucose. And again, you always wanna refer back to the overall equation, which is that this carbon, right, turns into this carbon here. So now think about what that's gonna turn into. If you guessed CO2, you are correct. So we end up generating CO2, and we also end up generating a NADH, which these are very, very important. We're gonna see how important they are very shortly, but you wanna keep track of these. So that right there is an electron carrier, right? It's got those two electrons, right, that came out of this this carbon here. And now we have a five carbon molecule. So I think you guessed it. This five carbon molecule turns into a four carbon molecule. Which means we have now lost, and this is pretty important, we have now lost that last carbon that we had from that original glucose. We end up generating another CO2 from that. And we also end up generating another NADH, another electron carrier. Now this is a four carbon molecule. This oxaloacetate is a four carbon molecule. So you might be wondering why we still have all this space 
Well, what we're going to do is we're just going to rearrange these a little bit and adjust them as we move along because we still have a little more material to get out of this. And so let's go ahead and rearrange this a little bit to another four carbon molecule. But as we did that, we were able to get some ATP out, some energy, which you always want to keep track of the ATPs in, in respiration. Okay, and again, you don't have to memorize the names of these four carbon molecules. They each have different names. But just know that we are getting some ATP. You shuffle it again a little bit and you get this another four carbon molecule. Now let's put a little star here. We're going to get something very similar to NADH, but it's called something different. It's called FADH2. This is another type of electron carrier. Don't worry too much about understanding why you have two types of electron carriers. They have a very, very similar function. So for our purposes, we'll just call these electron carriers. You do have to memorize NADH, FADH2. So you do want to know what they're called, but just basically understand that they're electron carriers. And now you do this one more time to end up get, coming back to our oxaloacetate, another rearrangement. However, we also get NADH out of this last rearrangement. And so notice how, even though we had this four carbon molecule down here, by rearranging it a few more times, we were able to make some ATP, and we were also able to generate a couple of more electron carriers. And this is known as the Krebs cycle. So we did this with one acetyl-CoA, right? But if you remember over here, right? We had two of them that we had to keep track of, right? So they're both gonna do this, right? We just saw what one did, but the other one's gonna go into the Krebs cycle too, right? So think about how you wanna keep track of that here. Right? If one of them is giving you an NADH there, an NADH there, an ATP there, an FADH2 there, an NADH there, right? then you multiply this by 2 basically to get your overall. right? So let's just go ahead and put up at the top our second acetyl-CoA because right, two of them are going to end up doing this. And then let's multiply what we get out of one by two, right? So here, right, two NADHs actually come out here because we got two of them that are going to do it. So two NADHs, um, here it's going to be two, four, right? And then six. So six NADH total, right? Here, if two of them are going to do this, we're going to end up getting a total of 2 FADH2. Right? We're going to get a total of not one, but two ATPs. And our CO2 that comes out right there and right there, right? That's only for one of these, the two CO2s, but actually we're going to lose all of them, all four of them. So four CO2s are going to come out of the Krebs cycle. So you want to keep track of that. Let's add that to our original step summary right here. All right, we'll call this three Krebs. cycle, right? And we know that we have 
two acetyl-CoA's. Right, and we know that out of this, okay, out of this, right, we burn through all our carbon, so these are all gone, so we can't really draw any carbon molecules anymore. We just, right, we just put in this stuff that we added together. Right, so let's go ahead and do that. So out of it, we're gonna get Six NADH, two FADH2, so a lot of electron carriers, right? That means a lot of oxidation took place in the Krebs cycle, right? A lot of removing electrons from that original glucose. Okay, we also have two ATPs. And we have four carbon dioxides. So you don't have any more carbons left, right? From this original carb, uh, glucose molecule. And so notice if you, you know, all this math should work out. So it's good to check. Let's see, okay? Let's see what we've done in terms of CO2s. Because remember, we should have six CO2s at the end after we right after we go through all six of these. Well let's just let's just make sure. Right? So here are two CO2s. Okay. Here are four CO2s. So notice, right? Two plus four is six, and that's why you have six right here. So all of this should end up making sense and fit perfectly with this equation at the top. So, so far we've done three steps and we, before we get to the last step, it, it's good to summarize what we have at this point. So let's go ahead and add up everything that we've got at this point. So at this point, At this point, right, what do we have? We have, let's count up the CO2s first, which is what we just did, right? We've got four CO2s there and two there. So we have six CO2s, right? It's good to know. We're done with those. Let's see how many ATPs we've made total so far. There's two, and there's two more, right? So for a total of four ATPs, okay? And what about the electron carriers, which are really what the last step is all about? Well, you've got 2 NADH there, plus 2 is 4, right? Plus 6, 10. So you've made 10 NADH total at this point. And again, you have to think, well, you know, what's the point of these? We're about to see it, okay? And then we have that other electron carrier, FADH2. You only have those two right there from the Krebs cycle. So you've got two FADH2, right? And just to remind you where we're at, right? We are here, we finish with the Krebs cycle and our electron carriers are now going to uh, be used for this last and final step. So, Let's draw another mitochondrion here with finishing with the Krebs cycle and going to this last step. It's important to remember what mitochondria look like. So mitochondria do have these membranes that are folded 
within right this folded membrane within one of the reasons why it's folded like this is because it places proteins so I'm going to draw four in a row here and the, the fourth one is going to look a little different right it places these proteins within that phospholipid bilayer membrane there. And it does that, okay, it does that throughout this folded membrane. Okay? So you've got these four, four proteins in a row that are studded all over the place here, okay? And I'm, I'm just going to draw it one more time, but you know, you have to imagine it pretty much everywhere, this folded, this folded uh, membrane, okay? And you got to think, well, what's going on there? Well, th this is known as the electron transport chain. And so we're going to zoom in onto one of these and really see how it works with these electron carriers, right? Because remember, you've got the Krebs, which is going around, right? And out of this Krebs, right, you're getting your NADH, and your FADH2 that come out of this Krebs, right? And so, and we had these also elsewhere as well. But now we can really see what the purpose, sorry for that last F, that's an FADH2. Okay, uh, kind of smudged that a little bit. But these electron carriers are now gonna to go to these proteins. And these proteins are gonna do what they are famous for doing, okay? So let's go ahead and zoom in on to, uh, let's just go with this one right here. Okay, let's just go with this one. We'll, we're gonna zoom into this one and see what it looks like. So just keep that image in mind. So here is that part of that protein. I'm sorry, that part of that membrane. I should, I should, wanted to say and you have these proteins that are kind of channels remember there's four of them and they have different names but for the purposes of this of this course you don't have to uh, worry about the names of these. The last one has that different, a different look. Okay, so here we go. Here are these proteins. And basically, what we want to do is we want to bring in our electron carriers. And so you've got the NADH that comes in to that first one. And these electrons end up going from that NADH to that first protein. And so now for the first time, you've actually removed those electrons from these electron carriers, right? So now these electrons are found right there on that protein and that NADH has now lost them to turn into NAD plus. So it's, it's, it's lost those electrons. It can now go back uh, to early steps and try to grab them. But now these electrons are here and um, these electrons are gonna also come off of the FADH2, 
right? So these two electrons now jump from DFADH2, go to that protein, and that FADH2 turns into FAD+, right? And again, you know, these, these two, both of these, what just happened, right? These are classic redox reactions, right? Where you have this one now that got oxidized and now these proteins get to get reduced. Now, every single time this happens, what's really, really important to understand here is that these work as um, H plus pumps. H plus is hydrogen ion. So hydrogen ions, ions get pumped from one side of this membrane of the mitochondrion to the other side. And sometimes you'll see these H pluses just referred to as protons in textbooks because, well, if you think of hydrogen, right, the hydrogen atom, it's number one on the atomic, on the uh, periodic table of elements because it has one proton in the middle. If it loses its electron and becomes positively charged, well, it's basically just a proton. So sometimes you'll see it called protons. Sometimes you'll just see it called hydrogen ion, okay? So just, uh, just you know, be aware of that, that that's the same thing, right? Whether you call them protons or hydrogen ions, it's the same thing. And so all of these are gonna do that. They're all gonna take H plus and pump it to one side of this membrane to basically get one side of the membrane um, very concentrated in H plus. Now this last, um, this last protein here is going to end up, if we look at our original equation, which is this one, right? If you remember, we, uh, we talked about glucose with the six carbons. We talked about carbon dioxide, right? However, we are missing the oxygen and the water here. And so th these proteins can explain these two entities. Okay, because what's going to happen is, is that these electrons are not going to stay on these proteins. They're going to end up jumping from one protein to the next. They're going to, like a domino effect, the next ones are going to get pushed to the next one. And now these electrons are now found on this last protein in this chain. And so now what happens is that you end up getting instead of hydrogen pumped to one side, you take hydrogen and you take two of them and you give it to oxygen you give these two electrons to them because notice this is a positive charge on that hydrogen so it needs electrons so these electrons end up finally jumping off this electron transport chain towards that oxygen and hydrogen and these two now fuse right to give us H2O water and now you finally have the water molecule that is in that equation and so sometimes you'll refer to oxygen being called, right? Oxygen is, okay, the final electron acceptor of the electron transport chain. And that's actually why you need to inhale oxygen in the first place. So when you look at one of our original sheets, which was this one, 
right, where we said, okay, you need glucose to come in and you need oxygen to come in, right, what happened to that oxygen? Why was this oxygen even necessary in order to do any of this respiration? Well, now you know, one of the proteins within the mitochondrion in the electron transport chain, okay, is gonna give those electrons that came in to that oxygen, it's gonna grab some hydrogen as well, and it's gonna generate that water, and that's gonna allow for these electrons to basically get removed from the electron transport chain, so the electron transport chain can do this stuff again, because if it's filled with electrons, the electrons uh, are not gonna jump from the electron carriers to it, so it needs to empty its electrons out and oxygen receives them in order to generate the water. And now when it empties out the electrons, we can get more electron carriers to come in, right, and keep on pumping hydrogens to this side of the membrane. And so what happens is that this side of the membrane fills up with a bunch of hydrogen because of this electron transport chain. And now we finally get to the last part, which is this protein at the very end. This protein at the very end is gonna use this high concentration of hydrogen. And if you remember diffusion, one of the reasons why we talk about diffusion so much is because we see it over and over again. And diffusion is when we go from higher concentration right, to lower concentration. And so all this hydrogen here now is in high concentration on this side of the membrane. It now wants to go to the other side of the membrane. And so that's what it does. It starts going this way through this last molecule. And this last molecule has an amazing ability to use that H plus going through it to spin around like a motor. So it starts spinning, literally spinning like a motor. And that spinning ability allows for it to take ADP and P, right? Adenosine diphosphate and a phosphate and link them together from that energy to make a bunch of ATP. And basically, if you want to know how much this can do, right, from one glucose, right, oxidation, this protein, this last protein in the electron transport chain can give you 32 ATPs, which is a lot. So all of a sudden you cash in with this last protein. And so this last protein has a very important name. It's known as ATP synthase because of the word synthesis. It synthesizes ATP. That's the name of this last protein in the electron transport chain. And it has that name because of this right here. And so now, if you really wanted to add everything up, right, after the electron transport chain, right, so we're, this was before the electron transport chain, we had this, okay, okay, after electron transport chain, ETC, right, you use these electron carriers to power that electron transport chain, right? Now you can add your 32 to that four. And so your total ATP, okay, is gonna be 36 ATP. Okay, and um, now, you'll see this number changing a little bit depending on which textbook you're looking at. So, 
this 36. Sometimes you'll see it uh, in a slightly different number, just based on different experiments that have been done over time. But for us, that's what we're going to go with. And that's, that is the overall process of respiration. And so let's go ahead and finish, right, by first saying that um, looking at this one right here, right, we want to add the last one, electron transport chain, okay? We want to say that these electron carriers go in, so we have NADH, right? Um, we want to use all of them, so we'll have 10 NADHs that go in. We'll have two FADH2s, right, that go into the electron transport chain. And as a result, with ATP synthase at the end, right, first of all, we do get our, right, we, we, uh, we lose our six oxygens. So we lose those because of that final electron acceptor. We do generate our six H2Os, right? Our water comes from the electron transport chain. But, okay, probably the most important thing is gonna be our 32 ATPs. And that is all of cellular respiration. Um, you want to go over this several times because obviously it's complicated. I will say I have simplified it as much as I can, but uh, this does take practice. So keep on writing these out and uh, try to get um, some enjoyment out of learning such an such a in interesting process that your body has to go through every single time it has to make energy for itself.